The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. A few announcements at the beginning today. Uh, this is 3091. Uh, for those of you who are new to the class, welcome. Uh, a couple of administrative things. When you join 3091, regardless of what registration took place outside, uh, please check in with my office. I want you to check in with either Hillary or Lori, who will assign you to both to a lecture section. There's a lecture now, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 11. Uh, there's also a lecture Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 1, and we're trying to level out the populations so that they balance the seating capacity. Um, and also, likewise, with the recitations. We have recitations that run all day long, Tuesdays and Thursdays. The earliest one is at 9. The latest one is at 4. And again, we're trying to balance the occupancy there so that uh, we have good access to the uh, recitation instructor. So please don't go squatting. We need to know uh, what the populations are. Uh, and that office is just down the hall here in uh, 8201. Uh, there it is. So there's the, we're supposed to take that light out, but uh, maybe by the end of the semester a miracle will occur. So why don't you look over here. So there's the coordinates, uh, 8201, and uh, talk to Lori or to uh, uh, Hillary. Uh, there'll be a test on Tuesday based on homework one, 10 minutes at the beginning of the recitation. Uh, you are allowed to use on the test, the official version of the periodic table of the elements, which uh, most of you should have by now. The, well, there was a shipment that came in uh, partway through the day on Thursday. So if you didn't get a periodic table, swing by the office. It's just down the hall from this uh, lecture theater. And you bring the periodic table and the table of constants and a calculator and something to write with. It's four items. We show up, sit down, and the first question is, uh, does anybody have a pen? Well, we may not have that many pens, so those are the four items. You do not use an age sheet on the weekly test. Age sheet is for the monthly test, not for the weeklies. Um, I've asked all of my recitation instructors to state office hours, and I, too, will have office hours. So if you want to come and see me Monday, 3.30 to 4.30, just down the hall, come in and see me. If you can't come by at that hour, you can send me email. And um, I'll be happy to meet with you, and I, I, I mean that. I get to meet a lot of people through the course of teaching, and I recognize a lot of uh, faces. Um, can't say I remember everybody's name, but I will recognize you. Um, and the same thing with the office hours for the TAs. The office hours are a time when they will be seated waiting for visitors. That means they will not look at their email. They will not take telephone calls. They, were, they will be sitting there waiting for Visitors, if you cannot make the office hours, again, contact the recitation instructor, make other arrangements. Yes? Um, is there a limit to the type of calculator one can use during the test? No, I don't care. The question is, is there a limit to the kind of calculator? I don't care. You can bring a mainframe in on a truck. I don't care. <laughs> doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. You know, big calculator. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm holding you on your honor. I'm, I'm assuming you haven't loaded the Encyclopedia Britannica into the memory. It's a calculator. So aid in computational efforts. Um, what else do I have to tell you? Uh, the readings. The readings, uh, the readings, well, here's the homework. This is what it's based upon, and we were issuing those. When you go to sign into the class, you'll get the copy of this. Uh, some people ask me, if you've bought the earlier version of the text, you can find the uh, translation to the earlier uh, version of the text on these question numbers, and if you go to the website and you look down here fall term 02 go to fall term 02 and those homeworks are listed bilingually last year I listed them and there were not that many people that had the first uh, ver uh, edition of the text so but if you if you have the first edition of the text go to fall term 02 and it'll show you the the earlier translations uh, in preparation for lectures I urge you to do some reading and so up here you look at lecture topics it's the second button down and you'll get to a page that looks like this. And so for today, for example, it says classification schemes, Mendeleev, atomic structure, reading, chapter one, chapter two, appendix A. I don't cover everything in there, 
but you're not in high school anymore. You know, you're going to read, you're going to learn, you're going to come to lecture, I'm going to hit some high points, things that I find particularly interesting. But it's not sort of, well, he said we're going to read this, but then he didn't talk about it in class. Well, get over it. <laughs> now, when you start looking for uh, next week, you're going to see um, reference to a chapter, which is in the core text. And you also see this, LN, 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 archives. What are they? These are archived lecture notes that were written by my predecessor, Professor Witt. And if you go to the... Um, if you go back to here and you click on Archive Notes, it's the fourth button down, that'll take you to something that looks like this. And if you look at Archive Notes number one, this is what you'll see. So in some instances, these notes are superior to the text. There's a reason for it. 3091 has a syllabus that is unlike general chemistry taught anywhere else on the planet. That's why you paid so much money to come here. You didn't pay money to come here to take something that you could get just anywhere. The, that's the good news. The bad news is there isn't a text that fits this syllabus. Right. So we choose readings from various sources, and the text that I've chosen is the best of a bad lot. Okay? It at least overlaps to a greater extent than most of the other books. And using the text plus these archive notes, I think you'll be able to piece together what you need. And you know, there's a third alternative. I don't know if you know this. Maybe on the campus tour, they kept you away from this part of the campus. But if you go over to the east and close to the river, there's a building. It's called the library. <laughs> and you know what they have in the library? They have books. And if you go into the library, you could find books on topics that we're discussing here. And you could read on your own, even. But I wouldn't dare suggest anything so radical. Okay. Um, oh, by the way, speaking of text, uh, we, my, my office got a call from the uh, purveyors of text, Quantum and uh, the Coop, and I don't work for them, and this is purely a courtesy so that they'll know what inventory to keep. Could I have a show of hands of people who are planning to buy the text but haven't done so yet? Would one of the TAs count? Because I, I don't want to just... <laughs> Hold your hands up. I'm going to keep talking, but the TAs, we just want to get a rough idea so we can tell them they need to have another 20 or they need to have another 100. I don't know. All right. Two, two significant digits is good enough. We don't need to know. Okay. So I think that's everything that I wanted to cover. Yeah. Oh, yes. And, of course, the webcast is available so that uh, if you miss something during lecture or if you miss lecture altogether, you can uh, go to the website, click on the webcast, and follow uh, what happened in lecture. So, let's see. Let's get on with the lesson. Last day, we started talking about taxonomy, and we looked at uh, classification schemes, starting with Democritus, which was very forward-looking, and then the backtracking of Aristotle. And I'd like to go further. We started with just the seven metals and uh, carbon plus sulfur. It was a point of departure for Democritus. And um, the uh, Aristotelian view held for a long time, but eventually it started to crumble in the light of more data. And again, all of these uh, slides that I'm showing, I'll convert to PDF and it'll be posted at the website. So you can just watch, take notes, but you don't have to copy every last detail down. So by the time of the American Revolution, these are the elements that were known. And here we have the arsenic, antimony, and bismuth, three delightful elements that were given us in the 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries by the alchemists. In 13th century India, they knew how to uh, isolate metallic zinc. In fact, there's a pillar there of high-purity zinc that stood for the duration. It's almost 1,000 years now, and it's in high purity. Uh, platinum was unknown until the Spanish came to South America. It's unknown. It's an American metal. Platinum was an American metal. And oddly enough, it was given a, a bad name. A plata is uh, silver, so platina is like a diminutive of silver. But we now know that platinum is, is far superior to silver. It's far more noble, has a higher melting point, higher chemical inertness. Fantastic metal, American metal. And then, uh, <laughs> and then all of a sudden we have discovered, 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 discovered. What does this mean? Well, are we saying that until 1774 there was no oxygen because it was discovered then? No, what does it mean? It means it was isolated 
isolated and characterized. Isolated and characterized. So Lavoisier characterized oxygen. Cavendish characterized hydrogen. And so now we see the shift from craft to science. Right? So now we've got all this data, and this uh, Aristotelian model is looking goofier and goofier. So we need to have some better explanation. And one of the earliest was that of John Dalton. John Dalton was a, uh, an Englishman who uh, proposed the following classification of the elements. John Dalton's uh, um, science was very accurately weighing the elements. So he's arranged the elements here in a column. It's a double column, but it's, it's only made double for convenience. As you can see it starts with hydrogen and goes to mercury in ascending order of atomic mass. And he was very proficient at measuring atomic mass. And furthermore, he started to abbreviate. Instead of writing gold, he made this symbol. Silver was S with a circle. He could have worked on a ranch out in the, in the, in the West, couldn't he? This looks like branding things, aren't they? <laughs> well, uh, this is interesting, cute fonts, but uh, in point of fact, uh, they were short-lived Berzelius. The Swedish chemist suggested that the French might uh, take umbrage at having to use I for iron. So he said, why don't we choose something neutral? Let's choose Latin, the language of scholarship. And so iron became Fe for ferrum, and uh, lead became Pb for plumbum, and gold is Au for aurum, and so on. And nobody quibbles because nobody speaks Latin, so it's uh, neutral for everybody. Okay? Uh, John Dalton also talked about other things. He said, I, I'm going to propose a model. And this is uh, right out of the text, out of chapter 1 of the text, 1803. And these are the planks of his model, that matter is composed of atoms that are indivisible and indestructible. Well, doesn't that sound an awful lot like Democritus? He's taking us back. He's getting us out of that Aristotelian rut and moving us back to something that makes more sense. All atoms of an element are identical. That's good. Atoms of different elements have different weights and different chemical properties. Well, this is important. The word property is really important to connect the concept of property with something fundamental in the makeup, in the constitution. Right? So what I'm doing is, I'm, listen to me, I'm talking at two levels here. I'm talking at the level of this is Dalton's model, but then there's a, a meta-knowledge here of how you develop models in general. If you're trying to model... I don't know, the efficacy of a particular drug. These are the baby steps that you'll go through. Atoms of different elements combine in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. That's important. That elements, because they are the building blocks, they combine in whole number multiples. If you have a set of blocks, mechanical, physical blocks, and I tell you to build something, and I say, oh, by the way, you have to cut the blocks in smaller pieces, you're going to get angry, aren't you? You're going to say, well, I thought these were the blocks. So these are the basic blocks, so therefore whole number ratios is a consequence of that. And lastly, this is Democritus, that the, that the being is made of particles that are eternal. This is eternity here. Atoms cannot be created or destroyed. And when a compound is decomposed, the atoms are recovered unchanged. This is good stuff. It's 200 years ago. It was just uh, last fall that there was uh, some events in the world celebrating the bicentennial of Dalton's uh, scientific achievements. There were other classes. Oh, by the, just to let you know, these scientists of that era, they were polymaths. They weren't specialists. You know, I'm specialist of atoms that are left-handed on Thursday afternoons and don't talk to me about anything else. These people had broad scientific interests. Dalton did a lot of work on vision. He, like many men, uh, was afflicted with red-green color blindness. And he, under, he developed the understanding of red-green color blindness, and it is known as Daltonism. Same man. Other classifications, Doberiner and Jena, talked about triads. People remember, they were, mem they were measuring atomic masses. So he saw that if you take the atomic mass of chlorine, add it to the atomic mass of iodine, divide by two, you get something that's really close to the atomic mass of bromine. And he did it for other triads, and he found that the middle member of the triad had an atomic mass that was midway between the atomic masses of the end members. An attempt. Got to give him credit. Second was Newlands that I'll talk about. I like Newlands because he had a musical, a musical flair about him. He talked about octaves. He said, look at sodium. Magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, potassium. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Potassium lies one octave from sodium. 
He talked about octaves. When he presented his results at the uh, sitting of the Royal Society, he was ridiculed, he was laughed at, he was derided. Somebody rose and asked him if he had considered putting the elements in alphabetical order. They were very cruel. You know? These people were nasty. They don't welcome innovation. Science is very hostile to innovation when it challenges existing theory. Sort of like management, you know, same thing. <laughs> so let's move on to something that really uh, took the giant step ahead, and that was Mendeleev. And I also want to mention uh, Lothar Meyer in uh, Tübingen, who came up with the same classification scheme, but we're going to see in a moment why uh, Meyer is uh, not well um, celebrated today, and the glory goes to Mendeleev. 19, 1869, Mendeleev. Here's a picture of him taken from that period. He was 35 years old at the time he enunciated this. 35. Positively brilliant. Here's his paper. It was published in the Journal of Russian Chemical Society, 1869. And it's really great because he actually goes through the thought process for you and, and describes. I need to give you one piece of background. Mendeleev played cards. And he traveled by train. And so to pass the time, he would play solitaire. So he was used to working with cards and putting things in rows and columns by suit. So you had to find what is the distinguishing feature. Well, these are all clubs. These are all spades. These are all hearts. And I get down to a certain card, and I'm stumped. So I will leave a space waiting for that card to appear on cue. That's the background. So here he is. He has all the information he, ha he knows that has been reported on the various elements on file cards. And he would carry them around in his pocket. And he'd look at them from time to time and try to devise a scheme. Remember, the other people, the octaves had been enunciated, the, the triads had been enunciated. So here he is in his paper, and he says, at that time, I decided that it was advantageous to find a more general system of the elements. And here's my attempt. And here he has laid them all out, and he's left blanks here, question marks here. He says it's advantageous to put them in rows and to form a table. And here's the, here's the smoking gun sentence right here. And it says, finally, it came to place, according to this uh, concocted system, and I've underlined in red, very many undiscovered members. So what does he do? He knows that he shouldn't put arsenic under He shouldn't put arsenic under aluminum. Arsenic's nothing like aluminum. Arsenic is like phosphorus. So he takes those two facts, plus the courage to leave blanks, and this is what he gives us. This is what he gives us. Lothar Meyer was doing the same thing, but Mendeleev does something more. He says, not only does arsenic belong under phosphorus, I predict that there is an element that lies below aluminum and above indium. And I will go even further, and I will predict what its atomic mass is. So he called them Ika. Ika comes from Sanskrit, meaning one, one after. All right, so Ika aluminum is one after aluminum. He predicted 68 for the atomic mass. Gallium was subsequently isolated, 69.7. Ika silicon, which we now know to be germanium, 72, 72.6. He says there's an element under zirconium, and it should be about 180. He said there should be an element under boron. He called it Ica boron scandium, 45, 45. It gets better. He goes into excruciating detail. This is his prediction for silicon. I already showed you the atomic mass. He says, I predict its density, 5.5. It was measured 5.36. He says it'll have a high melting point. Well, that's arbitrary. It me melts at 958, forms a dioxide, has a high melting point, and he predicts the density of the oxide of the yet undiscovered element and he gets it right to two significant figures. And then he says the tetrachloride will be volatile, and it will have a density of 1.9, and subsequently germanium tetrachloride was synthesized and measured to be 1.88. That's why we celebrate Mendeleev. So what we're seeing here is a big transition from just experiment and documentation to modern chemistry. And how does modern chemistry work? Well, first of all, look at the data. We always have to look around us and, uh, and 
Account for all the evidence. And this is an ethical question, people. Sometimes you get data that throw you off. And it's so easy to dismiss those data. What you have to do is have the courage to say, I've got to account for the bad data, what I think are bad data, and the data that help me build my theory. So you recognize patterns. And then you develop a model, most desirably a quantitative model, a quantitative model that explains the observations, obviously. But what Mendeleev did is he came up with a model that not only explained what we have observed, but it made predictions. And it made predictions that can be tested. I'd love to make predictions that, I, that you can't test. Hmm? Let's make predictions that can be put to the test. So this is modern chemistry. So I've told you about the table of the elements. Why do we call it the periodic table? Well, again, go back to the website. And down here is a button called courseware. And if you click on courseware, you'll get to this menu, the first of which uh, preferences is periodic table. So if you click, click on periodic table, you can get a variety of choices. One of them here I uh, happen to choose is boiling point versus atomic number. Mendeleev, Mendeleev is the one who taught us that the properties, the properties of the elements are a function of the atomic mass. So let's, let's get that down. By the way, the Cyrillic, the Cyrillic to Latin translation has not been agreed upon. So you will see Mendeleev's name spelled many different ways. You'll see it spelled like this. You'll see it spelled like this, like this, and so on. And so when you do a, a search, it's sometimes frustrating. But I'll use various forms. So Mendeleev wrote, he wrote the following. He says that the properties, the properties of the elements, the properties of the elements are or let's say vary. The properties of the elements vary periodically, periodically with atomic mass, with atomic mass. We'll find out later that that's almost correct. There's a slight variant on there, but right now I'm going to give it to you as Mendeleev enunciated it. So atomic number, we'll learn later, is, is the improvement. So that's why this says atomic number, but for most intents and purposes, we can say this could be atomic mass. So what I'm looking at here is boiling point as a function of atomic number. And what we see is it's not monotonic. It's not continuously rising, continuously falling. It seems to rise and then fall. And then it rises and then it falls. And then it rises and then it falls. And it rises and then it falls. And if you laid this out in, in, in a table, as Mendeleev did with his cards, you'd find that the local maxima all occur roughly in the same horizontal position from the endpoints of the rows. And then there's a trend going from least massive to most massive. So that's where the periodic comes. So we have a table of the elements with properties varying periodically with atomic mass. So we compress all of that information and we refer to it as the periodic table. Here's atomic radius versus atomic number. You see, the radius is high, then it falls. It rises, it falls. It rises, it falls. It rises, it falls. We're going to now go into the atom and try to understand the scientific basis for this observed behavior. And so here's the periodic table in its, in its glory today, following on Mendeleev's scheme. Uh, the elements have been named up through uh, the one that you're getting uh, hasn't got the latest information. This uh, was named over the past summer. This is element 110, which has been named uh, Darmstadium, after Darmstadt. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Okay. So uh, if you do look down at the periodic table and you get, you get above 109, you'll see these strange notations here, UUN, UUU, UUB. What is all of this? These are elements that have yet to be isolated. They're yet to be isolated. These are elements that are um, unstable. Okay? So these are what are known as the super heavies. So elements, elements beyond uranium. Elements beyond uranium. These are synthetic. These are synthetic. And where are they made? The manufacturing facility, there's three places on the planet 
that have the high energy physics uh, equipment in order to make these. And these are the three places. One is Dubna in the former Soviet Union in Russia. One is in Darmstadt in Germany. And the third one is in the United States in Berkeley. These are the three places where they have the accelerators and the kinds of reactions. Here's how they were able to make uh, Darmstadium. They take an atom of lead, accelerate it, and have it collide with a, an atom of nickel. And if the conditions are right, they will combine, fuse, and form Darmstadium plus neutron. So these, these uh, devices, when I was a, a youngster, were colloquially known as atom smashers because they have the capacity to actually break these and have them reform. And there's various forces that uh, play in the nucleus that will dictate when this will be stable and when it won't be. Uh, yeah, they isolated it, but it decays very quickly on the order of microseconds lifetime on the order of microseconds. So you can imagine that's why we don't have the boiling point of Darmstadium and this electrical conductivity. Right? They've isolated it enough that they can actually say the bare minimum about it. And um, so we have it. Uh, and then just so that you'll be literate in the rest of the periodic table, if you look at the higher ones, this is how you name them. Use these Latin prefixes. So 111 would be un plus un plus un. So 115 is un, un, pentium. And that's why you see these UUP, UUN. So my favorite is 111 because that's un, un, unium. So I'm going to be sad when they finally get a, get a name for it. Uh, yeah, there they are. Okay. And, and, and when they are named, they're named by suggestion by the scientists who have isolated them. And there's a lot of competition. Obviously, uh, if, it, if it's... Uh, if it's a Russian team that uh, isolates the uh, element, they're going to advocate the name of a Russian scientist or a Russian uh, location or whatnot. Obviously, the work that was done to isolate 110 was done in Germany, and they proposed the name Darmstadt, and hence it's named Darmstadium. Uh, there is a Dubnium, and there's also Berkelium. And there's all, if you look in the very high numbers, the, you'll see these, these nomenclatures. So there's Darmstadium sitting here. Uh, for reading, if you're really curious about some of this uh, early history, I can recommend this book. It's uh, Mendeleev's Dream. I read it uh, summer before last. It's got a lot, of course, about Mendeleev, but what's really interesting is the author assumes that the reader hasn't taken 3091, and so the first three chapters take you through the history of chemistry, starting with Democritus, and takes you through the Aristotelian theory. After you've had this, these lectures, it'll be a, uh, a joy to read. Okay, so now let's go inside the atom. Let's go inside the atom to try to understand what's going on. And this is taken from your book, Table 1.3. And so these are the subatomic particles that we have to uh, contend with. We have the electron. It uh, bears a negative charge in the value of uh, minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. This is the uh, SI unit, the Système International unit for electric charge. And it has a mass of 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Uh, the, the charge compensation comes out of the nucleus with uh, the proton, and it's uh, positive, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. But its mass is 1,800 times that of the electron. The electron is just a little gnat in comparison to the proton. And then there's this third species, the neutron, which has no charge, roughly equal in mass to that of the, of the proton. And so what we do in order to designate uh, the identity of an atom is to do the following. I'm going to let this be, this is the atomic symbol, the atomic symbol which was given by Berzelius. This is the Latin one or two letter character. And we begin with the, the proton number. The proton number is in the lower left corner, Z, proton number, number of protons in the nucleus, which in the neutral atom, this is number of protons in the nucleus, which in a neutral atom is equal to the number of electrons. Now to get to the number of neutrons, what we do is we go up here to the upper left, and this is called the atomic mass. Atomic mass. 
and it's equal to the sum of the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So we get at the number of neutrons indirectly, because we know the proton number here. This is sum of protons plus neutrons. And we don't put the number of the mass of the electrons, because they're so uh, light in comparison. So this will give us the, uh, the sum that we need. And at some level, we, we really there's some redundancy here. So if we want to write sodium, for example, sodium 23, 11. Well, 11 means it's sodium. If you've got 11 protons, it must be sodium. So we could get away with just 23 sodium. And if you wanted to be really, really smart, Alec, you could write sodium like this. You don't need anything here. OK? Uh, just a suggestion. Now, atoms need not be neutral. They need not be neutral. They can be uh, ch uh, charge deficient or charge excessive. And so Faraday, Michael Faraday, uh, coined the term ion coined the term ion for uh, atoms of net charge, atoms and other species bearing net charge. So for example, the positive ions, positive ions, these are electron deficient. We can't do anything about, can't do anything about protons. They're buried in the nucleus, but we can add or subtract electrons. So pro uh, the positive ions are electron deficient, and these are known as cations. They're known as cations. And uh, you can use uh, mnemonics to try to keep these straight. I see the T as sort of uh, a plus sign. Um, you, you also know that uh, cat, it comes from um, the fact that in, a, in an electrochemical cell that uh, the cations are those that are reduced. So you know from catastrophe, Kata is Greek for down. Catastrophe is a downturn. So that's the cation. The, the negative ions, the negative ions, these are electron rich. They have an excess of electrons. And these are known as anions. Anions, all right? I, you, it's got the an, which, which might conjure up negative. Or um, anion and minus both have five letters. I don't know how you want to try to keep those straight. But anyways, OK. Now, those mnemonics sometimes come in handy. All right, now the last thing is that because the neutron has no net charge, we can change neutron number. Okay, Neutron has no charge. So this means you can vary. You can vary the neutron number without, without changing chemical identity, because chemical identity is fixed by the proton. And since we don't have to charge compensate, we can add or subtract um, neutrons uh, at liberty. And so you can look, for example, at the periodic table. And uh, if you look up the um, atomic mass of carbon, you'll see that carbon comes at 12.011 for carbon. 12.011. Well, isn't this against Dalton? This thing's supposed to be a whole number here. But if you look more carefully, you'll find that this is a blend of three different forms of carbon. We have carbon 12. I'll even leave off the 6 because we already know it's carbon. It has to have 6 protons. So carbon 12, we know that it's got the proton number by definition is 6. And the neutron number, 6 from 12, is 6. So it's got 6 protons and 6 neutrons. And it is the dominant form of carbon. So its abundance, its abundance in nature is 98.892%. 98.892%. There is a carbon-13, however. So it axiomatically must be six protons, and it's got seven neutrons. And this is found in the abundance of about 1.108%. And then there's the last form, carbon-14, which is a radioactive form. And we'll talk about that later. 3091 and its use in radiocarbon dating. And carbon-14, 6 again, and it has 8. And it is found in vanishingly small amounts, 10 to the minus 12, or part per trillion. Part per trillion. So if you add all these up, then you end up with 12.011 as the atomic mass. So we have here, they all have the same Z, same proton number, okay, but different A different A, which is, means uh, 
number of neutrons varies. Okay? So that means they're found on the same place on the periodic table. So if they're found in the same place, it's isotopos. So these are called isotopes. Isotopes have the same chemical identity but different uh, uh, nuclear uh, properties. What are the units here? We write 12.011. We're writing 12.011. It's either grams per mole, and I'm not making a mistake here. Most of chemistry has gone SI, so every mass should be in kilograms, but occasionally there's this one little remnant of the old CGS systems, uh, centimeters, grams, second, and this is one. So this is 12.011 grams per mole or 12.011 atomic mass units. Atomic mass units, AMU. And the AMU is defined, the AMU is defined as uh, the mass of, mass of one twelfth of a carbon-12 atom, the mass of one-twelfth of... So I talked about this, uh, this concept of mole here. What is the mole? Mole is a more practical value, something that we can handle tangibly. And how do we get the, the value of the mole? The mole is something that was also defined in terms of carbon, and the mole is defined as the mass of, excuse me, it's the amount, the amount of carbon-12 weighing exactly 12.000 grams. So you can see the atomic mass unit uh, will then give you that the atomic mass unit will be one point uh, excuse me. Let, me. let me go at it a different way. This will be the definition of the mole as the amount of carbon weighing exactly 12 grams. So I'd like to know now how many particles, how many carbons are there in that mole? And one way we can get to that is by looking at two pieces of data. The first one, again, is by Faraday. Faraday, who conducted electrolysis of silver. Electrolysis of silver. In an aqueous solution, he passes electric current and he causes silver ions to deposit and form metallic silver. And he measures how much charge is required. He has current, right? We know that charge is equal to the integral of current times the time. And he knows the current, he knows how much time, and then he weighs this. So he's able to weigh the silver and compare it to carbon, and against that scale, he finds the silver weighs 107 grams versus 12 grams for carbon. So that's the ratio. And now if he only knew what the electron brought him, he'd be able to divide through and calculate how many species there are in a mole. And in order to determine that, we had to wait a few years until 1909. 1909, Robert Millikan, doing experiments at the University of Chicago, conducted this interesting uh, effort where he took atomizer, filled it with oil, and then squirted fine droplets of oil mist in between two plates that could be electrically charged. He further charged the droplets by irradiating. Here it's showing X. He used X-rays. He used various forms of high-energy radiation in order to make the droplets bear a charge. So now you have this situation where you have a droplet that is net negative or perhaps net positive, and it lies suspended between two plates, and I'm able to vary the voltage on the plates, making this for argument's sake, negative, and this, for argument's sake, positive. So if there's no charge on the plates, these droplets will simply fall under gravity. Once the droplets are charged, it makes no difference whether there's... Uh, it, it, they will fall regardless of the charge. When the charge is applied, if the upper plate is negative, we would expect that the negative droplet would be repelled at a rate exceeding gravitational fall, 
the positive droplet, will, its fall will be slowed and could even be made to lift. And so by playing with a variety of, of sizes, remember the atomizer is going to give a distribution of droplet sizes, a distribution of voltages, Millikan was able to, to uh, develop a relationship between the applied charge and the observed velocities of the droplets. So let's plot droplet velocity as a function of looking at the number that have this velocity with the zero being in the center here. So what do you expect is going to happen? If there were no, if there were no um, velocity, uh, voltage on the plates, we would expect everything to be over here in some negative value, falling. But what he found was a distribution. He found a distribution. And if you look more closely at the distribution, here's what he found. He found that some droplets had a certain velocity, and then others had a velocity plus some step, and others had a velocity plus some step. And he couldn't get values of velocity in between certain steps. He reasoned then that the charge, since he could vary voltage continuously, but he got a discontinuous variation in velocity, his conclusion is that the charge must be discontinuously attached to the droplet. So out of that, he concludes charge must be quantized. Charge is quantized. In other words, it comes in batches of a certain unit. Charge is quantized. And secondly, he was able to measure the value, measure value of the elemental charge. We use the term element to mean the, the lowest value. So the element is carbon. That's the smallest unit. Chemically, this is the smallest unit of charge. And he gave us a value that turns out to be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs in modern times. And the electron has a negative charge, so we would say the, the charge on the electron is minus 1.6. But I want you to learn this as E being the elementary charge. E is the finest charge that is available to be uh, attached. And so now, if we take the value of the Faraday, Faraday found that to get 107 grams of silver required 96,485 coulombs. This is on the basis of the integral of the current times the time. And Millikan said that E is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. This is coulombs per charge, and this is coulombs per mole. If you divide the two of them th through, you'll get 6.02 times 10 to, the 10 to the plus 23 per mole. So this is how much charge there is in a mole of electrons. This is the number of carbons there is in a mole of carbon. And this is given the value n Avogadro, the notation n Avogadro. Avogadro. Avogadro's number, we call it. Avogadro was a professor of chemistry at the University of Turin, who did a lot of work on gas laws, understanding the number of gas particles in a given volume at a given temperature. Isn't this nice? They named constants after professors. They didn't name it after a baseball player, right? They named it after a professor. So now we know the Avogadro number, and we're able to count the uh, the quantities accordingly. So what I'm going to do next day is uh, go into the um, larger stoichiometry and understand the principles of mass balance and uh, uh, reactivity. But before you go, hold it. I don't want you racing off. We, we should be going to 55 minutes um, after the hour. So I have, a, have something to, to, uh, to share with you. Um, I don't know if you heard this morning, but there was uh, news of the discovery of yet one more element. You didn't hear that? I guess you were busy. Yeah, I just this is I got this off uh, NPR. It says the discovery of the heaviest element known to science has been reported. Obviously, it's got to be heavy. All the light ones have been discovered. The new ones are going to be heavy. So that's great reporting. <laughs> the element uh, tentatively named administratium. 
It's been tentatively named Administratium. Um, and this will have to go up before the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry before they, they approve it because they fought over uh, element uh, 106 for the longest time. But I think this will go through fairly quickly. Well, maybe not. Um, it has no protons, um, so therefore it has no electrons, right? Because proton number equals electron number, which means its atomic number, if it has no protons, its atomic number is zero. See, you're learning all right, all right? However, it does have one neutron, it has 125 assistance to the neutron, <laughs> has 75 vice neutrons and 111 assistance to the vice neutrons. That gives it a mass number of 312. Um, the 312 particles are held together in the nucleus by a force that involves the continuous exchange of meson-like particles called memoons. These memoons just go back and forth. Uh, now, there are no electrons, so there can be no electronic mail. Right? <laughs> so we speculate there may be neutronic mail here, but anyways. Now, let's talk about the properties. Since it has no electrons, it must be chemically inert. Right? It's chemically inert. However, it can be detected indirectly because it seems to impede every reaction in which it is present. <laughs> According to the discoverers, the presence of a few nanograms of administratium made one reaction that normally takes less than a second take over four business days. <laughs> oh, there's more. Because it's heavy, you expect. It's radioactive. It's got a half-life of approximately three years. At, at which time it stops decaying. Then it undergoes a reorganization, <laughs> which the vice neutrons, assistance to the neutron, the assistance of the vice neutrons exchange places. And uh, there's some early indications that the mass actually increases after each reorganization. <laughs> okay, so now I'll, I'll, send you, I'll send you on the weekend with a, with a chemistry joke. We have to have a couple of, a little bit of humor, okay? So this, I need it quiet, though. All right, so... Um, yeah, it's, it comes right over here. Uh, actually, this one, we have to put the audio visual up. This is the one you need. You need this one right here. You see this? Okay, so it's so a neutron. Neutron walks into a bar, right? Neutron walks into a bar. He sits down at the bar. The bartender looks at him. He says, hey, I know you. You're a neutron. He says, yeah, yeah, I'm a neutron. He says, neutron's kind of quiet. Finally, he looks up and he says, uh, how much uh, for a beer? The bartender says, for you? No charge. <laughs> okay, get out of here. Have a nice weekend.